from Music for All and presented by Yamaha, it's Teaching Social Emotional Learning Through Music, a practical web series for all music educators, embedding SEL into music education. On this episode, we welcome composer Omar Thomas. Please welcome the host of Teaching Social Emotional Learning Through Music, Scott Edgar. Thank you. Welcome to our next episode of Teaching Social and Emotional Learning Through Music. Today's guest is composer Omar Thomas. Omar, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Oh, our honor. Uh, so as we've been talking, social and emotional learning is gaining so much steam in our schools, in our districts, in other ways that our music teachers are just trying to figure out how to make this applicable in their lives. And for me, it really comes down to making a connection. So can you start us off by talking a little bit about your music journey and maybe some of the key people who have connected in your life to lead you to where you are right now? Sure, and I just wanna say that I've been thinking about it, that um, social and emotional learning as applied to music is something that I've always thought um, had to be connected and inextricably linked. Um, so it's, it's, it's really heartening to hear that there is a solid push to, to make real this kind of connective learning now. Um, but we're talking about music. We're talking about the emotion behind the music. We're talking about the, the, um, the social goings on that have created all the pieces that we love. And to me, all of those things are, are inextricably bound, bound. So this is, this is the right move. Um, my, my connection to music has been, um, well, you know, I should say that I am 100% a product of public school music education. I think that's a very important thing for me to articulate uh, up front, right? I started in, in, with the trombone in fourth grade um, and, you know, played in band, played in orchestra in elementary school. It was like a full symphony orchestra, which is like... <laughs> you know, of, of fifth graders and sixth graders, which, you know, didn't sound great, but it was an incredible experience for us. And um, and then in middle school, I had access to jazz ensemble, did that. In high school, I had access to marching band, did that, was a drum major of my high school marching band, did choir. I did all the things, you know, and got my uh, bachelor's degree from James Madison University in music education. And I uh, got my master's degree from the New England Conservatory up in Boston in, in uh, jazz composition. And, you know, I graduated with my master's in, in May of 2008, and I was the new faculty orientation at Berkeley College of Music in August of 2008. And I've been teaching at the college level ever since. Um, so all of my heroes and all of my inspirations, um, hands down, are all of my teachers who saw the light in me and, and nurtured that and didn't kick me out of their office because I was always in their office hanging out, you know, and would tolerate all of my questions. My middle school band director, David Chepakaitis, was also uh, my private trombone teacher. And I learned so much um, in those sessions after school where we would play the real book. And I would play the melody and he'd play the roots of the chords and vice versa, we'd switch. I just learned so much about harmony and how it worked and harmony and melody relationship through that. Um, my high school band director for letting me run rehearsals when he was gone and letting me conduct a piece at the concert, you know. Um, also in middle school, I got to do this arrangement of Axel Foley <laughs> from Beverly Hills Cop, which was like probably my first time having my, any of my arrangements uh, performed, you know. Um, in college, I just had a, a whole array of inspirational um, teachers and professors. And um, specifically in the jazz ensemble, um, I was just introduced to music that, that blew me away. You know, our, my jazz director was Chuck Dotis and, and David Pope was also, um, is still well, one of the uh, jazz directors there at JMU. Um, had an incredible nurturing from one professor, Andy Langford. Um, so, I mean, uh, hats off and my heart's out to all of those incredible teachers who, uh, the reason I'm here, who just kind of showed me things and showed me recordings and showed me techniques and introduced me to music that they just continue to expand my heart and my mind. Omar, I, I love that throughout every chapter of your life, there was someone there who you could connect with and someone who was relevant to you and gave you space and gave you opportunity. I think my favorite word in what you said throughout all that was access, that you had access to these opportunities. I think that's something that when we look at the social and emotional elements of music that we can really focus on, that we're making sure that we can provide access to as many of our students as possible. Uh, in terms of, and, and you may not have uh, one answer that you can pinpoint, but is there a piece of music or one specific example that hooked your heart and said, this is what I want to do for my 
livelihood for the rest of my life. Oh my God, so many. <laughs> um, one specific moment was my junior year band trip in high school. I think we we're in, in Montreal and our wind ensemble played uh, three, three relations from the Lotus Sutra by Alfred Reed. We played the last movement rejoicing. And I had such a heart burst at the climax of that piece that I couldn't play anymore, which I mean, in, in a competition, you should probably be playing your instrument, right? <laughs> but um, I mean, the judge at the time was from Juilliard. I remember on the tapes that they gave us afterwards, she was just like, you know, I really don't have anything to say about that performance. It was, you know, and I remember sitting in, on the stage um, making that music. Um, when I was in college, uh, this was probably my freshman year, and a group of us were playing in a pit orchestra at the University of Virginia. So we were driving east over, I think, 66 over the mountain, and I'm in the back seat, and um, a friend of mine was playing in the car, uh, Maria Schneider's hang gliding, which that piece was a complete revelation for me in every way because her music specifically gave me permission to show up as I was in this arena. I just didn't know that big band music could be that, you know? In high school, it was Hal Leonard charts, it was Mark Taylor charts, it was Mike Tomorrow, all great music, all a huge part of, of jazz history and the jazz canon. But that's what, that was my sound for big band. That's what I thought big band was. So hearing the Maria Schneider Orchestra was just a complete revelation and it opened up my entire world. Um, Another moment was when I was 13 years old um, in Newark High School in Newark, Delaware. And fun fact, the Crossman drum corps used to rehearse at that high school before they moved to San Antonio. Um, they were based out of like Newark, Delaware in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And a friend of mine who was an older um, percussionist was marching in Crossman in 90. Eight, I think it was, and he gave me a CD of the music they were doing, and it was the Pat Metheny, um "The Road to You" live in Europe, and he played me first circle, and I hated it, right? And then I held on to that CD for eight months, and I played the whole CD again, and it was completely life changing. I don't know what happened to me in those eight months, but I. I more than got it. Like it really just hooked into me. And now I have like every Pat Metheny album ever. And, you know, I've listened to them ad nauseum. Like it's, you know, so those were three moments in particular um, that I just, you know, I kind of leveled up in some kind of way um, with my connection to music. What's interesting there is the music didn't change. You changed right. and your I experience changed. with the music really altered. I, That's right. You know, when you said, you said something there that just really resonated with me because, you know, I'm trying to think about what I know about you and how these experiences are funneling into who you are today. And without putting words into your mouth, uh, and please correct me, it seems to me like a lot of what you're trying to do right now is to do exactly what some of your mentors did for you, which was give you permission to show up. And that seems to exactly me, right. can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was given permission <laughs> and I just realized how important that was to my own personal musical development. You know, sometimes just seeing somebody doing a thing or showing up in a certain way that you didn't even think was possible. You know, um, when I go to my residencies back in the old world, when such things were possible before the world ended, um, you know, I would, I would think very intentionally about how I showed up physically in those spaces with regards to my hair and what I would wear at concerts. I just thought it was important for people to see someone that they're not used to seeing on the podium um, or, you know, a composer that they're not used to seeing come up to the stage um, and to talk to the audience and to talk to the students and to just say, we need you to show up as you are because I know that the people who you're used to seeing in front of you all kind of look a certain type of way and may come from some kind of an intertwined background, but we need all of us to tell all of our stories to have the most complete musical and sociocultural picture that we can paint. And the, the whole point about telling a story, that, that's something that I see powerfully in your music. And I want, we're going to dig into that in just a little bit. Um, but I, I see this as the entry point to us starting to talk about the buzzword. And, and the buzzword is social and emotional learning. But as you kicked us off today, we all talk about it in, in a different way. And it might not be calling it SEL. And it is intertwined. It is embedded in what we do. Uh, and one of the main purposes of this show is to start to connect some dots to say, you know, if I'm doing a piece by Omar Thomas, what's, what's there? What's at the heart of your music? So as you're going through uh, 
composing a piece or looking back on music that you've already composed, had you ever heard the term social and emotional learning? And if not, what was in your brain? What, what, what are you calling that element, that variable in music? No, I've never heard of that specific term. But to me, it, it was fascinating that there needed to be an entire kind of term and a focus on it. I don't understand how we're teaching this artistic discipline without talking about the ways that it connects. You know, I've thought about that a lot as a theory professor. And I've been teaching theory for over a decade now. And, um, and you hear horror stories from people who have taken theory and have absolutely hated it. Or people who once did music, they did like a theory class in college and were just like, I can't get it. And one of the, the connecting themes for people who have those experiences is that it was just too left brain, it was too mathematical. And I was thinking to myself, but we're talking about music, you know? It, I teach all kinds of analysis, Roman numeral, all kinds of symbols that we put on music as visual representations of emotional events, right? If you call something a one chord, you're saying that it feels different in a key uh, to a chord that you call the four chord, right? The difference between one and four is an emotional thing. Um, and that's the kind of connection that we have to make with the music um, when we're talking about it at an analytical level to make it real. Um, and then in terms of, you know, tying that into the social aspects, no art is created in a vacuum. It's all informed by a person's experience or life event or what's happening um, in the world, what has happened, something that could potentially happen. It's fueled by lived experience and imagination. And, um, and I think that we need to be highlighting that with regards to everything that we play, um, everything that we program, you know, there needs to be I think a bigger push to program and this, I have a feeling I'm going to say this again, but to program more intentionally, right. And to let our students do the work to dig out what this piece is, what it means, what it's saying, why it was written and, you know, um, why the composer might've made those decisions just to make that experience of this piece so much more real other than, um, you know, we're just going to pull this out of our folder, rehearse for 20 minutes and put it back in. Well, what did we just do? And why did we just do that? And why are we playing it at the concert other than we need a slow piece here? <laughs> and, and that gets at the whole reflection piece, which is central to social and emotional learning, that we don't just experience things, that we have to reflect on the experience for us to truly learn from them. So we don't make mistakes or just go through the process of fast, slow, fast on the concert. Sure. Um, Absolutely. You know, when I teach theory the first day, especially if it's at something that is more foundational, I say, you know what, I'm going to be honest with you from ground one, it's going to feel a little bit more like music fact than music theory, mm -hmm. you, you know, sure. and, and that's just kind of what it looks like. But I love how you explore the colors of different chords and how you relate to that emotionally. And we'll get to that in your music. I want to unpack some of that uh, and maybe some specific examples in some of your uh, pieces. Um, but as students are engaging with your music through a music teacher or through you when you take mm -hmm. the podium, what are some life skills that you think that we teach in music education that can go with them for the rest of their lives? Oh, um, openness, I think. Um, being receptive to new ideas, new people, deeper understanding, context, um, and learning as much as possible. You know, um, what I'm learning about my music, the more wind ensemble music I create is that a marcado accent may mean something completely different in one piece than it means in another, right? And <laughs> kind of realizing that that written music is very finite in that way, you know, and it's so not absolute. We do the best that we can as composers when we put music on the page to kind of um, be as clear as possible about what it is that we want, but, you know, there's a wall. So just curiosity, I also think. You know, um, always staying curious about your world. I, I think that that is probably the most important life skill, especially in this moment, right? Curiosity and, and a pursuit of a truth that exists inside of the context, not the truth that serves our own feelings about the way we think things should be, right? Because as soon as you apply context to whatever it is that you're wrestling with, what was gray becomes a lot less so and becomes a lot more clear. Um, so I think all of those things can be taught with music that we program and how we rehearse it and what kinds of activities that we build around the understanding of that piece. 
And we're going to get to exactly that, starting to unpack what type of activities, what kind of context we can build. And, and you know, that, that's kind of the gist of what we're talking about today is, you know, when it done well, it should never feel like social and emotional learning or these life skills is a distraction from the music. It should progress from the music and be embedded with the music. So, so absolutely. So I can't wait to hear your ideas on what that looks like. Do you perhaps have a story of one of the mentors that you already mentioned or, or somebody else who you think explicitly tried to teach some of those life skills? An example from your life, maybe. Um, oh, I have to think about this. Well, yes, actually, I do. And um, I, so when I was 19 years old, I think I had written my first big band piece and I written it by hand, score parts, everything. And, um, and I had a private lesson with Maria Schneider um, back when she lived at Central Park West. And I went to New York um, and my dad dropped me off at her apartment and I had the score tucked under my arm and I went to the elevator and I came out and I heard her call me from the end of the hall. And so I walked in, I played, you know, we sat down, um, I played her the recording that I had on my mini disc was back in the day for like, for like six years, mini disc was the way that we did things. I don't know what happened to the mini disc, but there was a moment where mini disc was everything. Um, and so I played her the piece and she said something profound. She was like, you know, this is beautiful. You know, she was kind of taken aback that I was the age that I did and kind of had the, the maturity, which of course was from listening and studying her music and all the other music that I've been exposed to. And she was like, you know, the piece that you want is in there. You just have to turn your pencil upside down and dig it out, which I thought was really a profound thing. But specifically with regards to what it is that you're talking about, that was supposed to be an hour lesson and we were together for four hours. We talked about life, we talked about food, we talked about art, you know, and again, just realizing that all of artistic, all of our artistic pursuits are informed by the world around us, you know, um, and all of that was relevant. Um, I think she knew that. And I don't even think that she was necessarily intentional about saying, oh, I'm going to keep him longer. We're going to talk about these things. But it was just a conversation that evolved out of a mutual appreciation for art and for music and for composition. And you find that, you know, when you're talking to people who are truly passionate in a way and you dig into that passion, that inevitably the conversation is going to talk, going to turn to books and it's going to turn to film and it's going to turn to travel and it's going to turn to uh, sociocultural and sociopolitical events because all of those things are what informs um, the music that we create either directly or subconsciously. Absolutely. And uh, wow, turn the pencil upside down, just how eloquently put, you know, I, yeah. I firmly believe that um, when this, I think one of the greatest skills we can give our students is to come up with multiple drafts, to try mm -hmm. things and come up with multiple ways. And that's how you learn how to make a decision. What mm -hmm. one do you like best? But oftentimes we see it as a box that we check that once right. I'm done, I'm done. Right. Well, you know, no one has come up with something meaningful without going through drafts or cutting off your left foot when you really don't want to cut sure. those eight bars. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, I, this is where I think we can facilitate our students voice and choice in our ensembles a little bit more strongly to give them the ability to come up with multiple interpretations and to say, which one do you like best? Even if it disagrees with what maybe I feel and then actually say, this is the one we're going to go with on the concert because this is the one that you like the best. So absolutely broadening beyond the one answer. So I, I love that. I'm going to steal that and take that <laughs> with me for a really long time. Um, I'd like to start to dig into some of your music that you cool. feel is, is really, really powerful. And as I was starting to study it and to prepare for our time today and think about the intersections between social and emotional learning, and you know, full disclosure, I had been working with uh, a band who was working on two of your pieces, Mother of a Revolution and Come Sunday. And we were working on social and emotional learning intersections with your music. So I, I'm really, really interested to hear what you think. But it seems to me like I, I could fit your music into two categories. One is music that is telling an essential story that maybe has not been heard and to do so musically. And the other one is opening doors so that the student's voice has a place. Again, giving permission to sit down at that table and go for it. So sure. 
under those two categories, um, you know, the, the pieces that I had in mind, uh, maybe we can start with uh, Mother of a Revolution and talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that piece. And to me, I see this as a little bit of both, that it is mm -hmm. a piece that is an essential story to tell, but a piece that could certainly resonate with some of our students today. Um, so what are some thoughts that you might have about taking that piece specifically uh, into our classroom as an entry point for social and emotional learning? Sure. Well, that's written about a person, and it's written about a person who um, who is a part of a particular group of people that has been rendered invisible and demonized and misunderstood, which is um, the trans community, specifically um, a black trans woman. Um, and so the name is a play on the the idea of a mother of a revolution, as in she is the mother of the modern day LGBT pride revolution. Um, and it's also a mother of a revolution with a, <laughs> with a special word omitted from the title, right? Um, and so first of all, just doing history about Marsha Johnson and, and using that as an entryway to understand not just her, but understanding the trans experience specifically you know, um, the black trans experience, uh, the black and brown trans experience, which is a, a bit of a different uh, uh, story to tell. And um, also understanding the pride movement. And it just, you, you start to uncover all of these intersections, right? And ways that you may or may not fit into these stories and find different ways that you can relate. Um, so there's that kind of historical, uh, look at the piece and, and that kind of sociocultural look at the piece, but also there's the music itself, right? It is a combination of basically a Marvel superhero theme because I'm a big superhero nerd and disco, right? And so understanding how then when the disco kicks in, how you have to approach it differently, right? How that bass line is written, it's split up, but it's written to sound like a synth. So it should just be it, sh it should be played with the kind of column of air that maybe we're not used to treating a note that has this over it, right? It's literally an unbroken sound. A synth sound is on and then it's off, right? And so what does that mean for how we control our air in that moment versus when we saw the symbol in the first half of the piece, right? How do we make this sound like that? And will this sound like that in another piece? Is that the intent as well, right? So we can have a whole conversation about disco and why I chose to use disco because that was a very obviously specific choice right and why i chose to do a superhero theme that's a very specific choice why did i choose to fuse the two that's a very specific choice so there's just so many different angles that you can jump into to really make this piece real and um to, and to allow all the students and the audience to connect with it as well can we dig into that a little bit more so why did you sure. choose disco and the superhero theme sure. for this particular topic Sure. Well, I, well, when you look at so many of the uh, big social movements um, that happen in the 20th century with regards to um, uh, uh, the rights of Black people and the rights of, of the, the gay and trans community, uh, Black trans women have been at the forefront of that. You know, and, and a big part of that is just because they have, well, first of all, they have a stake in all of it because their communities are affected because of intersectionality and they're a community that can't hide as well. So they don't. And they step up to bat. And I just think that that to just when, when your very existence is a threat to everyone just because you take in air and you decide to show up with your head held high anyway, I think that there is no braver thing. I think that that is worthy of a superhero theme, which is why I decided on that first half. The, the disco part is to honor the historical uh, LGBTQ safe spaces, which have been clubs and dance halls. And, you know, disco was the sound at the time of the uh, birth of the movement. And so I kind of wanted to, to fuse those two things together. Perfect, thank you for that, Omar. Um, now, the, the trickiest thing that I think many of our music teachers are trying to navigate right now is, yes, that's great. That's a story that I can tell in isolation, but how do we translate this to connect to our students' lives? So what are some entry points, maybe reflective questions that the music teacher could ask their group, whether it be to share out loud or just to kind of crawl inside of our kids' heads and say, you know, this is what Omar Thomas meant to do through this piece. Sure. How does this reflect and manifest in your life? Sure. Well, I think it's about painting the scene, right? This is a scene. It was 1969. These things were going on. This was happening. This was the incident that sparked this. Um, are, there, are there any aspects of this that you can connect with emotionally? 
even if you don't find yourself directly connected to uh, these communities that we're talking about, how would you feel in this situation? What would prompt such a revolution? What would get you to the point? You know, have you ever been so mad about something that you threw something, right? Well, how, well, what would it take for you to get so mad about something that you throw a brick through a window, you know, uh, and just appealing to the, the emotional humanity and the emotional commonality um, and just getting people to understand that there are money, many, many, many universes that are coexisting at the same time. And every time you walk by somebody down the street, their universe may be completely different than yours, but these realities coexist, you know? And so just getting people to be aware that I'm in a room or on a stage with 60 people, hopefully we'll get to that again one day soon. And just on the stage alone, there's so many different universes that we're all inhabiting. And what are those moments that our universes all crash up against each other and finding those commonalities? So I think that that's a, a, a really important place for, for for any piece like that to talk about. We should be thinking about that all the time. Honestly. And that and that's the social element that we're getting at, the social justice mm-hmm. element, the awareness of the world around us. Um, you know, I, I loved what you're talking about when we said, you know, what would it take to get you angry enough to throw a brick through a window? Because a central part of social and emotional learning is that every behavior and every emotion makes sense, that we need to validate emotions, that if you're ticked off, that's okay. We need to talk about how to manifest that. If sure. you're sad, if you're frustrated, you know, sure. right now, I don't know about you, but as we're starting to enter the fall, there are many things that I'm frustrated about. And you've mentioned sure. it a couple of times. I want to be on stage with 60 people and let's go. Sure. Uh, but that's okay. It's okay to be sad and frustrated. But I think there's so many uh, counter narratives right now that say, oh, just be happy. What can we do right. to fill our cups and just well, no, let's go ahead and embrace our emotions and then we'll learn how to work through them. So, so thank right. you for that really tangible musical example. Um, I'd like to transition to Come Sunday, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Uh, which it seems like you've just had such immense success around this piece. But I think that there's a reason that, uh, that this piece has taken off with such power. Uh, and I think that it really does get at this idea of opening doors. And whenever we open doors, there's go- that's going to be met with open arms and also a little bit of reticence. And I don't know if you've experienced both of those things, but uh, from my perspective, it is a true gift to the profession. So if you can talk a little bit about the process of Come Sunday, what's in your heart as you are putting uh, this piece out for the world? Sure. Well, the first thing I say about Come Sunday is that it's a piece that should have existed long before me, right? Because there's a long, rich tradition of sacred music um, being created for the concert stage. And so little of it is from the Black experience, right? Unless it's a spiritual. And as much as I love a spiritual, spirituals are trauma music. And there's more to the black experience than our trauma. And, and all of us deserves to be on that stage and just not the things that are about a very dark and painful past. Um, So especially the second movement, the shout, I mean, that's something to me that is just tailor made for when ensemble like how is this not how has this not happened before kind of thing, you know, um, and so I did it, <laughs> you know, I wanted to, I wanted to bring black church music is such a gift to the world. Black music is such a gift to the world, specifically um, the music that comes out of the gospel jazz blues tradition. I mean, it's just, it, it has permeated basically every corner of the globe in some way. And it was important for me to just kind of put that in this medium in a very authentic and intentional way. Not in a way that just kind of like, oh, it hints at it or it uses the this scale or it, you know, I wanted like, no, we're going to go ahead and put these chords and these melodies as they would exist in in its original state. And we're going to take it. And to the best of my ability, I am going to adapt it for uh, the wind ensemble. And, and I love it. I'm going to try to tie in something that you said earlier about how mm-hmm. chords in relation to a key can sure. have emotional meaning. Are there any specific examples in the shout section or not where you used chords intentionally to express a meaning? I mean, the chord progression of the entire first movement is just so church. It's, it's so church, you know, everything about it is church. And it's also because it's black church, it's also got a lot of soul in it and it's got a lot, a lot of R and B in it. And there are some chord progressions that I used in this piece, specifically that movement that I also used in of our new day begun, because both of those, their over, their their um their overlap it takes place in the church, 
right? So there are certain chord progressions, you know, that kind of two half diminished to the cadential six four is a sound that to me just is is so rooted in the black church tradition. And so that happens in very particular places in the first movement. And that happens uh, quite a bit in Of Our New Day Begun as well. So I was absolutely thinking um, about specific harmonic progressions. I mean, so the first movement is kind of written in chunks, right? And they all end with minor plagal cadences. And that's very intentional too, right? It's all of these different iterations of the same type of cadence, which is very church, you know? And so, yeah, I was, I was thinking about that first and foremost. It's so powerful. And, you know, I, I think one of the things that a lot of our teachers are, not a lot of the teachers, maybe some of our teachers who are performing some of this work are saying, you know, this isn't my tradition. I'm having a hard time wrapping my head on how to sure. share this with my students when this isn't sure. my background. It's an essential story to tell, but I don't have that as part of my worldview. Any pieces of advice uh, for someone who might be tackling either of the, you, you mentioned three pieces, and we're going to go to Of Our New Day Begun next, uh, mm -hmm. but people who are tackling some of these pieces yeah. uh, who don't have that background. Find somebody who can, right? Technology has made the world so small. Find somebody who can. You don't have to do this alone. <laughs> You're not in a bubble, you know? Maybe you have a student or two for whom this is this speaks directly to their experience. Have them speak about that, you know? Maybe there is someone in the community who um, has some specialty in this music, have, bring them in and have them speak about that, right? That, that goes to making this real and taking it off of our little stage or out of our little rehearsal room for the 50 minutes or the 70 minutes that we can rehearse and then all of a sudden ties it to something bigger, right? Find somebody who can, right? And Do as much homework as you can, but find somebody who can so that you're not then speaking on behalf of someone else's experience from a, from a under-informed place. And I actually think that this is part of the gift that you're giving the profession right now by doing this interview is you're giving us insight for us to be able to use that as an entry point to work through uh, some of these challenges, even if they aren't our challenges. Um, and this is something that I kind of want to go into and I see it intersecting with, uh, with of our new day begun. Uh, and I'm going to be very honest with you right now. There are some people who do see social and emotional learning. If we really focus on a misinterpretation of self-management is saying, oh, just feel happy. Just center everything in and just get over it. And that's not what social and emotional learning no, is. And not at all. Not at all. Um, but especially now, um, we are in a cultural situation in our country where we need to have as many levers for anti-racism as possible. Mm -hmm. And I firmly believe that social and emotional learning can help us amplify necessary voices if we get our students to be self-aware, socially aware, and to make good decisions. Sure. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how maybe you hope that your music is that lever? is that lever for anti-racism and can intersect into the hearts of our student musicians to further this necessary cause? Sure. Well, what I love about the power of music is that no, no matter how high or how thick someone's emotional walls are um, when they come into a concert situation, the music can just phase right through it and get on the other side, you know, and it just disarms them. Okay, so I think that that doing the work um, from from the student's perspective, from the conductor's perspective, to kind of prepare them to be the vessel for that, um, I think that that is that that happens in rehearsal. That happens when we're rehearsing a passage over and over again. But that also happens when you give them a homework assignment to go research something, or when you go try to find someone from experience to share their experience with them. Right? There are all of these different ways that we can arm and prepare ourselves to go forth and to just kind of get at somebody's soul, no matter how high the walls or how how, th how thick the walls or how fortified um, their their soul is against you know everything right so I, that's like one of the big gifts of what it is that we have the power to do um and so i'm just grateful every day that music is my tool and my medium um to be able to do that because of its power and you know i, I usually thank you for that uh, absolutely um you know I, I usually use the example of mr rogers that in 1969 you know he didn't come out and say 
racism is wrong. He did it by making an artistic statement on his show. And that was by putting his sure. feet in a kiddie pool with a sure. black man. Black and, man. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that was, you know, to me, that is the call to action that we have as musicians is that we can take stands in ways beyond sitting down in a room and having conversations and music can give us that artistic. And I firmly believe that your music can give us an artistic catalyst into this world. So, so thank you for that. Um, can we transition a little bit into of our new day begun specifically, uh, how you would like to see that piece maybe serve as, uh, an entry point for some of the discussions we were just talking about. Oh, it has served. And that's been the, one of the great honors of my life to have been the vessel for that piece to always center the Charleston nine and their families and the entire mother manual AME community. Um, I always hope and believe uh, that it's important before the piece that we have a reading of the names of the Charleston Nine. And if I'm ever in the audience um, at a residency, I always ask if I can just start the piece that way because it's important that people understand that this is about something. It's about some people. It's about a, a primordial evil in this country um, that has taken these lives and has continued to to strangle the lives out of uh, black and brown bodies in this country. And um, it's just important to set the stage. Um, I mean, I feel like that piece pedagogically can be such a gift with regards to social and emotional learning, right? Because this is this was an event that happened just just over five years ago. It was June 17th, 2015, I believe it was, you know, so it's very much recent history. Um, we're still seeing uh, and feeling the reverberations of these acts, and that act is in and of itself a reverberation of acts that have come before it as well, right? So it's just, it, this, that's, that's a piece where it's, it's pretty easy and pretty obvious how to make that um, real in the moment. So it really just takes kind of the courage of the director to go there, Right. And, and I, I feel like that's worth saying as well, um, especially or also with a piece like a mother of a revolution. Right. Um, you have to kind of gauge where you are. You have to gauge your community, you know, and understand what it is that you can kind of get away with without putting yourself in danger, without putting your livelihood in danger. It's hard. It takes it takes a courage and a bravery and an awareness of your community and uh, to just kind of like push that boundary. So I acknowledge that. But if this is the work that we are trying to do, if we are serious about the call of music and music's purpose, and we're serious about the place of art in the human story, then we, we those are risks that we have to be willing to take sometimes. I'm inspired. I mean, it's like, I just want to get back on a podium. You know, I, I've talked to some of my director friends and, and the first time that the baton drops in front of an ensemble, I'm going to be able to get through two measures before I'm just sure. crying like a baby. Uh, sure. and, and what you just said is the reason, you know, it's not the out of tune first notes that we're going to do that first time together. It's because of that opportunity that we have to reach into people's hearts. Um, Omar, this has been absolutely fabulous. And I, I really just wish from the bottom of my heart to thank you for everything that you've been able to give us, uh, both in terms of your musical product and being able to tie these connections to SEL. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us before we wrap this episode up? Um, one thing that I kind of wanted to mention, just I, I want everyone to acknowledge and realize and know that, that you know, um, as you mentioned the term anti-racism, that is ongoing work. There is no like checkered flag moment where you cross the finish line and you've done it. It's more like a chronic illness that everyone has to manage, right? And you, we're allowed to grow, we're allowed to make mistakes, um, and we're allowed to recover from that and to just be better, right? Um, so it's important that in those moments that we just catch ourselves, we sit with the discomfort of the moment and that we move forward. And to understand that like, you know, um, this, this very much is a journey. And to illustrate that point, I wanted to go back to that that Mr. Rogers incident that you mentioned, which was such a beautiful moment where he put his pool or put his feet in the pool with a black man. There is another side to that story. There's a little bit more to that story where that black man was gay and Mr. Rogers knew that and kind of asked him to keep that information to himself because at the time, right, it would not have have served the message. All right, so even such a beautiful moment is still kind of cast in this unfortunate light due to um, situations X, Y, or Z, right? But, but again, the idea is that hopefully 
um, Mr. Rogers had at some point in his life before he died progressed past that moment and there was a reconciliation there. But I know that, that gentleman, and forgive me for not remembering his name, was really um, uh, kind of heart sick about that, you know, um, being with one of the most uh, open, embracing, loving men um, that we've ever had the pleasure of knowing as a society and still not being able to show up as authentically as possible. So, you know, it's, it's always a journey. Right. Um, and we just have to realize that as we're trying to get ourselves there, there are people, many people around us in, our, in society who are dying for us to get there. And I use the word dying very literally. They are dying for us to get there. They're dying because we have not gotten there yet. So it's important for you to put in the work as much as you can um, every day so that everybody is allowed to enjoy the same experience of 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years on this earth that you were able to enjoy. So, you know, do this out of love for people around you and do this out of love for life and the belief that everybody should be able to enjoy that. Omar, absolutely. You know, the same thing is so true with social emotional learning. We never arrive. You know, we know many adults who don't have self-awareness and social awareness, and we certainly know people who are making bad decisions. Uh, and you, you've given us so much food for thought and perspective and the ability to make it musical through our time together today. So from the bottom of my heart, I, I thank you for joining us today. And thank you so this very such much. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Be well this fall, Omar. Thank you. Sounds good. You do the same. Take care. Yep. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Music for All's mission is to create, provide, and expand positively life-changing experiences through Music for All. Our vision is to be a catalyst to ensure that every child across America has access and opportunity to participate in active music making in their scholastic environment. I want to thank Omar Thomas for his heartfelt contribution to the series and enlightening us on how to make music with heart. I'd like to thank our national presenting sponsor, the Yamaha Corporation of America. Be sure to check out the Yamaha Educator Suite at yamahaeducatorsuite.com and GIA Publications for their support. Thank you and join us for our next episode of Teaching Social and Emotional Learning Through Music on Wednesday, October 7th. For Music for All, I'm Scott Edgar. Thank you.